morning. Good morning. All right, the recorder is recording, and I will just go ahead and get started here. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Are there any questions from the discussions before? Any questions you know, regarding just any general topic questions, like you know, not specific to your project because we can talk about that during the lab time. But any questions about you know, what a variable is? You know, what is an event handler? How to start a new screen? The process to download the APK file so you can actually you know, use the APK file to debug a multi-screen application. Any questions along those lines? No questions? Okay. Okay, if there are no questions, we have a few ways to proceed today. Okay, and okay, let me just show you the options here. We can proceed. So we are done with talking about event handling. Um, let me change the size again, because I think people in the back cannot see the lower portion. And I think this is good, right? A little bit higher. A little bit higher. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so we talked about. Oh, maybe we should talk about what is a notifier because I'm just going to go in this sequence here. So a notifier is going to be our main topic today because it's one of the really important features. It's really useful for debugging a program. Okay. You know, in this class, we don't really have a dedicated debugger as in you know, many other uh, software development platforms. So a notifier is meh, it's a pretty good way to you know, at least let your application send out a little message box and say, okay, at least I'm here, and this is the value of that. Okay, it gives you a, a mechanism to do that. So we'll go, go, we'll go ahead and talk about this first. Okay, but I still want to give you a roadmap of you know, what else we will be talking about. <clears throat> there are several programs that I have you know, included here uh, one is non-JSON serial, serializer, and the other one is JSON, J-S-O-N. It's not a typo. It is J-S-O-N. It's JavaScript object notation um, serializer. And at this point, it doesn't seem to make any sense. You know, what, what is that? I mean, you know, um, at some point, we are going to talk about variables and talk about lists. And I'm trying to find it right here. Uh, it's a little bit of, out of order. Um, we talked about global variables and values already, so that part we have pretty much covered. What we have not covered is the concept of a list. That will be a very, very useful concept. It's a little bit more advanced, okay? You know, you do need to understand a little bit more about, well, just more structure, okay? It's not necessarily that you have to understand programming in order to use a list, but it's more like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a structure thing. If you understand what, what a folder is, you know what a, list, what a list is, okay? So that's kind of the thing. So I will see if I can at least get a little bit into lists later on today. You know, once we cover, you know, notifiers, I think list will be next. Because that will give you guys a lot of options, you know, when, when you think about your own project, that will give you a lot of, you know, ideas. All right. So I don't really need to read my notes, you know, to teach the concepts, but I will go back just so that you know, you know which part of the notes we are talking about, and we are going to talk about you know, what is a notifier, or otherwise known as a dialog box. Okay. So you know, I have pictures here to show you guys you know, how to make one, but it's really best to just do it, okay? because it's more interactive, and you guys can stop me you know, as I'm doing it if you have any questions. So let's go ahead and get started with um, App Inventor. And we'll just go ahead and start, and start with a new project because the purpose of this new project is really just to show you how to use a notifier. So I'll just call this notifier. There we go. So now we have a blank uh, project. And remember, if you use the emulator approach, which is what I'll be using here, you also need to start up the um, AI starter. In Linux, it is in user, Google, app inventor, commands for App Inventor AI Starter. Um, if you're in Windows, it will give you a little icon on the desktop. Just double click on that one and it will be okay. Um, so now we have this started. Go back to the browser and we can now say start an emulator. There we go. All right, 
So as the emulator is starting, I can talk about what a notifier is. A notifier is an object that is quote unquote hidden. It is non-visible. So what good does it do if it is supposed to be notifying the user of something? How come it is not visible? Well, it's not visible most of the time until you say, hey, display a dialog box. I want to ask a user, the user a question. Okay? And the answer to the question can be you know, up to you. Okay? It's a button that the user has to click. And you can be notified, the application can be notified of which button the end user has clicked. So that gives you a lot of options because by labeling the buttons differently, you can now ask a different question. Okay? Um, the notifier is really useful for that sort of thing. Um, we'll just wait until the whole, un until AI companion connects because otherwise I can't really do anything at this point. Could go, it's getting there. <clears throat> All right, so this is good. We now have access to the emulator. Um, so for this particular app, I'm not going to do much. All I'm going to do is to put a button into here, change the label of the button, and I'll just have it say, you know, notify me. Okay, that's it. That's the name, the, the label on the button itself. We'll change the font size to be a little bit bigger so people can see it in the back. All right, so there's only one button. When you, if you want to use a notifier, you have to go back here and drag and drop a notifier object, which is right here, into <coughs> the viewer. Okay. So you go here, you drag the notifier, and then you drop it into the viewer which will not be a part of the screen because it will be listed as a non-visible component, which is okay. So don't worry, you know, it will you know, display as a non-visible component, which means normally it doesn't, it doesn't do a single thing. You cannot see the notifier. Are there, are there any questions at this point? Okay. These, the other thing is you already know that if you click on the question mark next to any type of object, it will give you some help. At the end of this, okay, it will give you more information. And if you click on more information, you can get you know, the details of how to use a notifier. A notifier does have a lot of cool features. Um, the message in the dialog, but not in the alert, can be formatted using HTML tags, which is kind of cool because now you can you know, use boldface and um, other types of uh, special effects. So we'll go ahead and see you know, how we can work with this. This is the design view. We're going to go to the blocks, because we're going to specify some code here. And because this is object-oriented programming, the first thing we need to do is to say, OK, but this program doesn't do a single thing until we press the button. Okay? And when you think about that, then the first thing you have to do is to go to button one, because it's object-oriented programming. So we want to handle the click event of button one, which means we go to button one first, locate the click event handler, which is the first one, just click on it, and it, it is now dropped into the blocks window. This is where we can insert the code to do something. Once again, we're not going to do anything fancy here. We just want to check out how to use a notifier. So now we click on notifier, and as you can see, notifier has two event handlers. We don't want to deal with those event handlers just yet because if you just look at the name of the event handlers, you know that mm, we need to do something else first because the first event handler is after choosing and then the second one is after text input. Both suggest that these events will happen after the user do something with the notifier, right? Well, but how do we get it even started first? So that's the first thing we need to do, is to display a notifier first. Then we'll talk about these two event handlers. Okay, so right now we are not too concerned. So if you scroll down, you can see that there are several blocks. Well, there are many blocks here. Um, you can log errors, inf information, warnings, and stuff like that. Show alert. Okay. Now when you show alert, <coughs> You can only have one option, which is you know what is the message. Okay, the end user has no choice. You cannot say okay or cancel. You can just say that yes, I acknowledge there is a message. 
Let's go ahead and try out this one first, okay? Because it's the easiest one to try out. So I drag this block out, snap it into this here. The notice, you know, has to be a text message. So we go to text here. You just drag and drop a empty block, and we'll just put here and say, pay attention, okay? Say, all right. Now remember, because we have AI companion running in the emulator, this program is already in the emulator. So we can switch back to the emulator and test this out. Test it and find out exactly what does it do. Click notify me, and you can see there's a pay attention. It's not even in the dialog box. It shows up for maybe five seconds or so, and then it disappears. Okay? So that's basically an alert message. It doesn't ask for confirmation. It doesn't, the end user doesn't click. It just shows up and it disappears. Okay. Any questions at this point? What is an alert? All right, that is not particularly useful because the user cannot interact with it. So we go back to Notifier, scroll down the list, and say, what else can we do? Show alert, show choose dialog. Okay, now this one looks pretty complicated. Okay, you can see there are a lot of slots here. And then we have so show message in dialog, which has you know, fewer buttons. Okay. Show progress dialog. Show text dialog. Okay. Now, what do you think is the difference between a show text dialog versus a show message dialog? The first one and the last one. I mean, if you're doing this along with me, you can hover over that and read about it. One allows you to enter text as a part of the dialog box, so you can interact and enter text. The other one is just um, clicking it. You can just you know, click it and acknowledge. Okay. So we're going to scroll up a little bit here and find the one we already uh, tried out show alert. We'll go ahead and uh, try out show choose dialog. Now, as the name implies, you know you already know what it does. So it shows a dialog box with two buttons from which the user can choose. But it only has two buttons. You are limited to only two. If cancelable is true, there will be an additional or third cancel button. Pressing a button will raise the after choosing event. In other words, this is how the event happens is after the user clicks on one of the two or three buttons, depending on whether it is cancelable or not. The choice parameter to after choosing will be the text on the button that was present that was pressed or cancel if the cancel button was pressed. So this is really useful if you need to ask the user to confirm something and you don't want to use up you know, the actual screen space because you know this is not something that is normally a part of your app. Okay? So let's check this out. You know, this one is relatively easy to use, but it also gives you a lot of options. Okay, so the, the first part is the message. The message is the part inside the dialog box, you know, which means you can include more text with the message. The title, on the other hand, is what is displayed up on the top, so that has to be rather you know, a little bit more brief. The text, uh, the buttons you know, should not be very long either. The text on the button should be kind of brief as well. And whether it's cancelable or not depends on the context. Are you asking the user to specify something that is cancelable? Then you should, should you should say yes. If not, then you can say no or false. All right. So let's go ahead and try this one out. We'll just be replicating a bunch of strings here or text. It's called text in App Inventor, but it's really a string in most other programming languages. <coughs> okay, so here's the message. The message, you know, from earlier, it says the message can use uh, HTML or certain type of HTML elements. So if you want boldface or stuff like that, you can do so using the uh, bracket B and then bracket slash B for boldface. Okay. But I'm not going to specify anything too fancy here. Okay. So we'll just go. Choose wisely. There we go. Okay. 
title is to Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. Go. All right. So the button one is going to be. Come on, this is coming from the movie. <laughs> Okay, the bad guy chose not so wisely. You know which which cup they did. Fancy one. The fancy one. Okay, so we just call it you know cup with bling. Okay, and then the other one is cup with stain. stain. Oh, okay. Wooden one. Okay. All right. So now we have you know a message box that would be that would be displayed, but we are not doing a single thing with the actual response, okay? So we just wanted to show up, see what, what it looks like, and we'll go ahead and play with that other stuff later, okay? So notify me, click it, and now we have the dialog box that says to, Indi to Indiana Jones, uh, choose wisely, and then come with bling, come with stain, and then the cancel button. Now, in this, ca in this case, because we are not handling you know, the clicking of the buttons, it doesn't matter which button you click, it doesn't do a single thing. The app doesn't have any logic to handle the clicking of the buttons. Are we still doing okay so far with this application? Okay. So the next thing I want to do is to try out different things and say, well, maybe I should both face your wise. Okay, so we'll use the bracket B and then the bracket slash B with message because if you hover over a message, If you hover over it, it shows a dialog box. Oh, it doesn't show exactly just that part here. But we'll switch back to the application, and you can see this time wisely is in bold face. So you can do certain types of formatting inside the dialog box, but don't display a whole lot of stuff because that's not what a uh, dialog box is supposed to do. It's not supposed to tell a whole story. It just describes what you're choosing. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, all right. So we want to, you know, okay, the next thing we want to do is maybe to bring up a different picture or give a different message depending on which choice the end user has chosen, okay? So now the question is, how are we gonna do that? Okay, if someone clicks on a cup with bling, how do we say, okay, you're dead, okay? If they choose the second one, you know, cup with stain, then you go like, Yes, okay, you chose wisely. And if they choose cancel, we can say, you, we can say chicken. <laughs> All right, so let's find out how to do that, okay? All right, so getting back, to, oh, I better you know, click one of these first. There we go. All right, if you read the help of this uh, choose dialog, it says something about, not this one, but if you go back to the designer view, it says something about uh, it will raise an event, okay? So what we'll do is we'll extend this program a little bit, but this time the notifier is the object because we want to handle the after choosing event. You know, once the user clicks in the dialog box to make a choice, that event happens, and it will be the code specified inside this block that executes. Go ahead and click it, just in your stash here, so we now have a new block. Now this one, unlike most other uh, event handlers, this one is a little bit special. Let me just <coughs> let you compare those two. With a button, you don't see a little pink box here, but with a after choosing, you see a little pink box called choice. This is called a parameter. In other words, when this event happens, not only can you start to execute your code, whatever code you put inside this block, but it will also give you some extra information, which is the choice that the end user has made based on the button that has been clicked. Okay. The other one, which is you know, when a button is clicked, does not have anything fancy like that, because when a button is clicked, well, I mean, there's nothing else that you need to know. You just know that, okay, this button has been clicked, do something about it. But when the user makes a choice in a notifier in a dialog box, 
you probably want to know which choice the user has chosen and do something accordingly. Do we have any questions about this part? Questions? All right. So let's find out what we can do here. Well, first of all, do you think there is one event handler per choice inside this inside these choices, within those choices? Nope, we only have one handler. So now the question is, with only one handler, how do we know which choice the end user has chosen? What do you think? Go ahead. We, we use the text, we use choice, right? So choice is gonna be very important here because you know, choice will actually contain the text of the button that is clicked. But inside a block of you know, after choosing, how do we make use of choice so that we can say, okay, this is what we want to do when you know, cup with bling is clicked, this is what we want to do when cup with stain is clicked, and this is what we want to do when cancel is clicked. What type of uh, block should we use? A if branch, okay, so something that can basically choose based on what we call Boolean or true false values, okay? Okay, very good. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and you know, pick one here, but before we go any further, we can make this application a little bit more fun, and what I'll do is I'm gonna search on the internet so that we can actually have the footage, okay, and we'll frame you know, a snapshot of the movie, you know, of you know, the For the guy who's who drunk from the, uh, the, the the one oh that that's a good picture right there. So we'll go ahead and <coughs> save image as put it into bad choice. <laughs> I think he got it for to save his companion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is it this one? Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. So we'll pick this one out. Save like as. Oh. Yes. We want to save image as. There we go. Save. Oh, good choice. There we go. All right. But this one is a. Well, I don't know the, ex the exact size of the image. Let's check out the, ac the actual size. The, the program that I use for you know, handling graphic stuff is called the GIMP. Um, it's kind of like Photoshop, but it's open source. It's, it's, it doesn't do everything that Photoshop can do, but for what I use, you know, for what I do, you know, it's good enough. So I can show you how to use uh, the GIMP. It is also available for Windows, okay? So this is not a Linux-only type of program. It is also available for Windows. You can do a lot of things that you normally would do with Photoshop with the GIMP. Okay, so we'll go ahead and open the file, and bad choice is this one. Okay, this is a fairly small image, you know, so it's, I think it's already small enough for the, uh, uh, for the application. We'll take a look at the other one. File open, good choice. And this one is pretty small too. Okay, so both of these are kind of the, the right resolution already. I don't think I have to do much about it. Now with the, the second one, okay, let me show you what you can do with uh, the GIMP. So from time to time, I will show you tools that I find useful for doing this sort of thing. <clears throat> So with this, you can crop it because I don't like the extra black area around the frame. <coughs> so I can crop it. Just you know, select a portion of the image that I really want, and then go to Image, select uh, Crop to Selection. There we go. 
And now I can resave the image by overwriting the original JPEG file. Okay, export. And this heavy uh, pixelation, I'm not sure whether you guys can see or not, but this is a really low resolution picture. But for what we are doing, it's okay, not an issue. Okay. All right. And I think I need one more image from the web. So we'll go look for chicken. In fact, I'll look for specific chickens. This one looks good. I like it. So we say save image as chicken. And by the way, this is a great movie. Chicken Run. Have you guys seen it? No? Okay. For those of you who haven't seen it, you know, it's really funny. I like it a lot. I used to watch um, Wally and Gromit. Wallace and Gromit. Wallace? Yeah. Wallace and Gromit. The first time I, w I watched the, uh, the penguin, you know, the penguin one, I laughed so hard that I had tears coming out of my eyes. It was so funny. <clears throat> All right, so we have now, now we have all the pictures, you know, all, all the images that I need. So we go back to the app, and it's the notifier one. I just noticed that we have, we have two windows open, which is okay. So we just continue with this one, go back to notifier. Now remember, all the images and sound files and all the media files, you have to upload it into the app first. So we're going to upload those files because okay, so we have bad choice. <coughs> and good choice. And there's one more, which is chicken. All right, so now that we have these three files uploaded, I might want to have a certain area on this screen kind of dedicated to display an image. So we'll go to, let's see here, image, put it here. And we are currently making the height automatic and the width automatic as well. And picture is none. Scale picture to fit, probably not something that I want to do. So we'll leave it away just way it is. All right, so now that we have the, the images and whatnot, you know, we can now continue. And I, I want to remember the names of the files, okay? Bad choice, good choice, and chicken. And they both, they all end with JPEG as an extension, which is not uh, JPG. JPG is kind of the usual. All right, so back to the blocks. Now we can specify the logic to do this. We have to use a conditional statement or branching, okay? Where do we go to find those things? Logic. Where, sorry? Logic. Con control, actually. So we, we go to control to get the overall blocks. We do have to go to logic, maybe, to get, well, I don't think we need to go to logic in this case, so let's, let's check it out. If then is good, okay, you know, we probably want just the if then, okay, so we'll click this block here and put it here. Then people will say, ah, but there's only one branch, okay? If a certain condition is true, if something is true, then go ahead and do this. Well, we have how many things to consider? We've got three things, right? So this is not going to do it. Well, hold on a second here. If you click on the little blue uh, box here, you can now say, ah, but I can specify else if, else if. The last one, you can kind of just do the else, okay? So now we have one, two, and three you know, branches. Okay, if I specify what to do within the damn branches, you guys can then tell me you know, what to use as a condition. So each one is going to display a different image in the image one element on the screen. So we'll go ahead and set image one to something, so we'll set the picture to a particular picture. So we'll replicate this block several times. We just have to specify a different image for each one. Okay. And then we go, to, go back to text, so that we can specify the name of the file to 
Just duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. Okay, so I want the, the first one to be bad choice. So bad choice dot jpeg. The second one is good choice. Good choice dot jpeg. And the last one is chicken dot jpeg. There we go. All right. So what should I put as the condition of the first branch? In other words, what do I put here? Click button. Hmm? Click button. Say again? Click button. Click button. Because it clicks this button. Okay, we know it has something to do with choice. But choice by itself is not going to be enough. Because I have to do something with choice. What do I need to do? Maybe compare it to the Exactly, we have to compare. Okay, so we need comparing, and where do I find the comparison of text? This one is kind of tricky right. because some people may think it's in logic, but it's actually yeah. in text. Okay, because when you're comparing text, it is actually part of text. So you go to here and you say compare text, that's what we need. So you put it here. Okay, we know one of the things that we're comparing against is choice. So when you hover over choice, you can just select get choice, which basically just you know, get the current value of choice. And then you can change the whatever the comparison itself. I don't really need to know whether it's less than or greater than. I need to know whether it is equal to. Okay, now what is what should I put here? That is the next question. The string, okay? The string of the buttons that we have chosen to use. Remember, cup with bling, cup with stain, and also cancel, okay? Those are the text that we use. So you have a choice here, okay? If you just want to do it the quote unquote easy way, this is how you do it. You just say, okay, let me go specify a string, put it here, and then just in here, type your cup, of, cup with bling, I think, yeah. There we go. But this approach has a problem. The problem is, what if I type it wrong? Uppercase, lowercase, extra space, exclamation point, punctuations, and stuff like that. So if I type it wrong, it's not going to match. <coughs> so what is what is a better way to do this? To identify it to this button uh, itself, this button one, button two. I need well, I need one common source, okay, to provide the actual string. And then I can use the same common source in both places. Yes? We can use a global variable, exactly. Okay? So that is, you know, if this is more like a programming discipline kind of thing. You know, it's not a language kind of thing, but it is how you utilize you know, um, the global variables. So instead of doing this, because I run a risk of not typing cup with bling correctly, or I type it slightly off, uppercase, lowercase, and other things. So instead of you know putting myself at risk <coughs> for this sort of thing, I am going to make a new global variable. So I would initialize a global variable, and because this is a string, or the only purpose for this is to be a string of a certain value, I personally like to use str, lowercase str, as a prefix. Now, if you don't want to use the word string, you can use text, okay? But I like to use a certain prefix so that you know, when I look at the long list of variables, I know which one is, you know, is for what purpose. So in this case, I can call this text, lowercase, and then we just you know, then give it a, an, an actual name, okay? Bad choice, okay? Then we can now use this to initialize cup with blink. So I drag this and put it here. Is that okay so far? Okay, we have a missing slot over there. What should I? What should we do about that missing slot here? This one here. We refer to the global variable because this is done at the beginning of the entire program. So at this point, I can now go back here and then say, let's go ahead and get the value of the global variable text bad, bad choice. Are we doing okay so far with this approach? So instead of specifying the actual string all over the place in the entire program, 
I try to use global variables to store the strings, so this way I can refer to the same string all over the place without having to worry that I, I might mistype here or there. Yep? Uh, for global variables, you don't have to uh, set up with like integers or strings or anything? No, the, there's no quote unquote type. Um, the fact that I we use this kind of magenta block here means it is already a string. But there's no limitation. You know, variables can change their actual type when we go through, when the program executes. Okay. Good question. Now, I have to go back and change the other one too, because this is you know, also still referring to the literal string. This is what we call a literal string, which means you know, the content of the string is defined right here. So we don't want to do this anymore. So we take this block out, okay, and instead we say, oh, let's refer to the same global variable of that particular value. So this way, I cannot make mistakes. I cannot have a typo, because I'm referring to the same global variable string. But tag, you can still specify the wrong name for the global variable. I can't, not with App Inventor. Because the only thing I can do is to choose which variable to use. If I can choose the wrong one, yes, I can still make a mistake, but I cannot have a typo. Is that okay? So this is something that is it's a good programming practice. It's not something that you have to do, but when you're managing a program that's kind of relatively big, and you, if you're like me, you know, with a lot of uh, a, a tendency to have typo mistakes, this is a better way to do things. Any questions? Let's take a look at logic here. Logic has comparison. I think these are numerical comparison. They may not be a straight comparison because inside text, it specifically says it'll compare texts. Um, that's a very good question. We will test it a little bit, okay? So we'll test, um, yeah, we'll, we'll test this uh, after we are done with this program. Everyone who should be here are here already, so I'm going to pass the row sheet. And we'll go ahead and start on this side. All right. So this program is, well, halfway done, you know, because we can now you know, just have another one with cup with stain. So right click, duplicate. And you can see that you know, it automatically changes the name of the global variable to text bad choice two. <coughs> That's because you cannot have the same name for two different global variables. Yep. Are you able to change this? Yes. So I can click here and change your know, bad choice two to <coughs> good choice. Okay. And of course, I still have to change the text too. So I, I throw away the literal string first because you know, that is no longer the correct one. Then I put in the correct one over here. So now I can duplicate this block, refer to the other string, the other global variable. And down here, I have to control the scroll bars correctly. So over here, I can duplicate this entire compare block. But this time, I'll be comparing against not the bad choice global variable, but the good choice global variable. Are we still doing okay so far with this? Okay. And then with the last one, for the chicken. Well, there are two ways to do this. One way is not to use an else if, and just use an else. Because if it's not a good choice and it's not a bad choice, I only have three buttons. It has got to be the cancel button. Okay, so that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at this is, well, I still want to confirm that it really is the cancel button. And you can do that by comparing against just the word cancel. So we'll go ahead and duplicate this block here. And this time we want to compare against to cancel. But once again, I don't want to write out cancel. Instead, I'll have another global variable initialized to just the word cancel itself. This is text 
cancel. Now, once again, I just want to re-emphasize, you do not have to start the global variables with the word TEXT. I just choose to do it that way, so this way I can tell what the global variable is about. Okay, it's not a counter, it is not a number, it really is just a string with the word, you know, something of something. So once I have cancel as a text, as a global variable, I can now go back to this block and change the reference to the global variable to text cancel. And I think the app is done. Well, let's go ahead and find out whether this is going to do what we think it's going to do, right? Okay. Go back to the app. Go back to the emulator. Click notify me. Let's choose cancel first because this one gives me the most worry. Ah, it doesn't seem to be working. Oh. Okay. I think it has to do with how I specify the picture. The file name may be incorrect, or this is not the way to specify it. Set image one dot picture. It should be picture. To bad choice dot jpg. Dot jpeg. Okay, let's take a look at the designer block here. Those are the file names. Is visible automatic height automatic width well my suspicion is the global variables are not initialized remember so this because the, the app has been running all along right as we make changes the app is running if I click notify me that's okay Go back to the uh, emulator. Okay, this part still works. So that means the, the strings are in fact initialized because otherwise it would not display a uh, cup with bling and cup with stain. So we know the global variables are initialized. So now the question is why is the image not being displayed? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to do this first. Okay, we'll just force it to use a certain number of pixels. So we'll make the width or make the height specifically to use 300, 200 pixels, and it will force the width to use exactly 300 pixels. Okay. Because I'm suspecting maybe it's the, the number, of the, uh, the image dimension that is making it not display correctly. So now we go back to the emulator again. All right. Let's go get more information. You know, to look at the uh, the help the, or the uh, reference manual of of an image. Okay. Properties, animation, height, picture visible. Specify whether the component should be visible on screen or not. It doesn't say a whole lot. Um, 
you get to, you get to choose a You got a message that popped up because there were like two um, app inventors open at the same time. Hmm. Well, possibly. Well, there's one 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 easy way to find that out is we can just change the text here. So we'll change this bling with uppercase B. Okay. All the all caps you know B L I N G. Then the app should be updated by the way. Ah, it's not getting updated. You're right. Okay, so maybe it's a communication issue with the uh, emulator. Yeah, because mine, mine is working. Yours is working? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's not connecting. We'll go ahead and reset the connection, which basically kills the emulator that we restarted. Good observation. But I was testing it too, you know, by changing bling to all upper all caps. You know, that if it is connecting, it should change it. But it wasn't con it was not connected. looking at the emulator and then that reminds me to tell you guys some one thing I saw it last night I thought about sending an email to all of you but I don't want to spam you uh, but I thought it's kind of interesting go to wood.com you don't have to go there you know I'm just going there so I can show you this is what I'm what I looked at last night and I thought hey maybe some people in this class you know, can use something like this 25 bucks shipping is another five bucks so 30 bucks 30 bucks plus maybe tax or something um, but you get to have a 8 gigabyte Android 4.4 tablet not the latest not the greatest okay I'm not saying this is you know, the top of the line tablet that can do all kinds of stuff but it is a tablet too. Hmm? Did you just read that? I just Real quick, it's fireproof. Fireproof. Nothing is fireproof. <laughs> Certainly not Kit Kat bar. <laughs> Just kidding. I thought that caught my attention. Fireproof. There it is, right there. See, on the left. On the left. For example, it has two cameras, and it's also fireproof. Oh, <laughs> we can't say it's fireproof. No, we can't. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is this is wood. Okay, wood always does always do something like that. You know, on the side, they always have a little conversation. One way to catch your attention for sure. Like, yeah, what? yeah, but it's a dual core, which is okay. You know, it's not top of the line. I think the the fastest tablet now has eight cores. I think it's an octa core. Okay, so dual core is like eh, yeah, it's okay. Yep. Do you know if it comes with an SD card or anything like that? Because we will need one of those in there. It's to hook up to the IT app manager. Um, well, let's check out the specs. So the, this is just the key feature. It also has a tab for just the just the specs. Okay, so this uh, is okay. built-in memory. That's all it needs to know. Yeah, but if you look at specs, it has it's got Wi-Fi. One camera is two megapixels, the other one is 2.3, USB 2, internal storage. Yeah, it does have micro SD card slot. Card not. Card not included. You can get it from Costco, Fry's, whatever you want, wherever you want to go. Some people just have the, those little SD cards that are sitting in a house anyway. Um, up to four hours of runtime and a full charge. So it's not a bad, bad deal for 30 bucks. You know, I think it's okay, you know. Um, especially if you don't have an Android device to play with, this may not be a bad choice. Okay, thirty bucks. It's a refurb item, which means you know it can come with a little scratch or you know signs of having been used before. Um, I bought 
vacuum cleaners refurbed from wood. And sometimes you know, the battery is all scuff, scuffed up, but you know it charges you know, just as well and it works just as well as a vacuum cleaner, so I don't really care. <laughs> So just just a deal that I think you know I can you know, point you guys to, and you can also read a uh, discussion. There are 18 comments right now, and sometimes the discussion are, are really good. Uh, let's check out this one. Not so good review over at Walmart. So one gig of RAM. I think that's the major complaint about it. So anyway, uh, I just want to point out, you know, about you know, this kind of deal. If you want to consider it, it, it is your um, consideration. <coughs> all right. So now this app has the emulator running again, and Bling is all caps. Good. That's a good sign. Let's check cancel first. Okay. Cancel displays the, uh, all the chickens. Uh, come with stain. That is correct. And it come with Bling correct as well. All right, so we got it working. Excellent. Any questions? No questions? Okay, I'm just looking at the clock right now. I have about half an hour or so. I want to get into lists. Okay, I really want to get into it. So let's go ahead and switch gear a little bit. Um, there are more stuff you can do with notifiers, but for the most part, you can read about it and it just kind of experiment with it. But I wanted to get into list because most people look at list and go like, yeah, well, you know, what is the big deal? But it is a big deal. So we'll go ahead and you know, start another program, okay, start a new project, and I'll just call this one lists. Okay. All right. So the with this program, I am going to do. Let's see what we want to do. Let's talk about the concept first, okay? With a normal global variable, okay? So let's just call it a global variable bar one, okay, for variable one. It can be stored, it can store certain types of values. There are three types of values, well, make it four, four kinds of values that App Inventor can deal with. A variable can store numbers, numerical values. Okay, that's pretty useful. One, two, three, and so on. Um, it's good for counting. Remember our counter app, the little app that we wrote, you know, for the guy who's sitting, who's standing in front of Costco, counting people going in. Okay, we have just talked about another type of value today, which is text. Okay, so with text, you know, I just use double quote here and just say, you know, good toys. That's a string or text. Um, it's not numerical value, it is just text value. There's a third one that we really haven't really used, but you can if you if that is what you need to do. It's a true false value. So you can store the result of a comparison into a variable. Okay? Is it true or is it false? That blah 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 blah. That can be stored in a variable. But these three are what we call atomic values. In other words, it cannot, it cannot be quote unquote broken up into smaller chunks, okay? Which is not entirely true because with a string you can kind of break it apart, but we'll still consider these what we call atomic, okay? Which means it cannot be broken down any further. And if you think about it, the word atom is the same way too. What is an atom? It's supposed to be undividable, right? But when you look into an atom, what do you get? You get electrons, right? You get neutrons, and then you have protons. So, <coughs> so, so, so the word atomic is not exactly true that it, it cannot be div divided into further. It's just that most of the time you look at it as one single unit. But now we will add a fourth type. Okay, the fourth type is called a list. Now, the good thing about a list is it is a folder. Okay. I'll just use open and close paren and then dot 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 here to indicate a list or to denote a list. Okay. With these three, it is great because you can store certain values. But 
with one variable, there's only one value that you can store. You can store a number, you can store a text, you can store a true false value, and that's it. With this, it's a folder. Yep. Uh, so is it like an array? It is like an array, but it's a little bit better than an array. Okay? So I'm glad that you, you brought it up because it is kind of like an array because with a list you can refer to the first <coughs> item, the second item, the third item. So it's kind of like an array in, you can index into individual parts of it. But unlike an array, items inside an array, um, the items inside the list can be of different types. So you can have a number, then a string, then a boolean, and then get and then guess what? Then you can have a sublist. Aha! That is the, the thing that one thing that makes a list so powerful is you can nest other lists in the inside a list. Remember what I said a little bit earlier. It is a folder. Can you put a folder inside another folder? Can you have subfolders when you're managing your files? Yes, you can. What about that subfolder? Can you have even sub subfolders inside that folder? Subfolder. Yes. Same thing with the list. Now that makes it a very powerful concept because now instead of just looking at the list as oh this is just one you know list of items. Well guess what? One of the items of the of this list by itself can be its own list. And so on. So this can go on you know quote unquote indefinitely. Are we doing it okay so far? So what this means is for your app, if you can store, it can, if you can represent everything that you want to store into TinyDB or you want to store remotely into a database, if you can encode everything into a single list, then you, can, you only need a single variable to store. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. So think about your own application, okay? Think about your own application, and then you think, okay, what kind of information do I need to store either into TinyDB or in the ideal case, you know, into a remote database or something like that? You might think of 20 things, okay? Maybe the username, how many times the user has used this application, the last time this application has started up, okay, or you know, when it, the last time it exited, or something along that line. So that you might come up with like 20 things that you want to store, which would normally turn would would normally use 20 items in TinyDB like that. Okay, but if you use a list, it becomes one single variable. It's just different parts of that variable. Okay. Are there any questions about the concept of a list? It is basically a folder, but unlike a folder. Everything inside the list is position sensitive. I'll be talking about the first item, the second item, or the third item. Okay. All right. So what we want to do here is to think of a. You know, if I will give you a. Um, let me see what I want to do here. Okay. First thing first is how do we make a list? Okay. That's the first thing we want to do. So we'll go ahead and make a button here, and change the caption on the button. And we'll call this initialize. Initialize list. That's the name of the button. And what we'll do is we'll use this button to trigger the initialization of a list, of a global variable that is a list. So in the blocks here, we'll go ahead and specify the handler of this click. And we also need a global variable, so we have to go to variables initialize global variable name to nothing. Okay, so I'm creating an empty list with this global variable name. We'll just call that, you know, uh, I don't want to call it list because otherwise it gets kind of confusing. Items, there we go. So the, the name of this one single variable is called quote unquote items. And when I initialize, I initialize it to an empty list, it, it has nothing in it, okay? But in the initialization button, I will go ahead and initialize it to something that has several items. So we go to variables, and then we say set variable to, the only variable we have is items. 
So now we can specify, okay, but what do you want to use to specify its new value? You can go to list here, and you can look at all of these options. Create empty list is one. Make a list is the second one. And if you hover over that, it says right here, create a list of any number of items. When you click on the blue box, you can then select you know, how many items will be in your list. Okay. You can also you know, do something like this. If you already have a list, you can append items to the list. In other words, you can make it longer. Okay. Now, this is also a difference between a list and an array. Because with an array, it's kind of a fixed size. You cannot really make it bigger or shorter. With a list, you can. You can basically just say, OK, I want to add one more item to the end of the list, which is appending to the end of the list. It's really handy this way. Um, okay, You can also search for things in a list. Returns true if the thing is an item in the list and false if not. So this is basically going through a list and see if the list has a particular item that has the same content as what you specify. I believe it, will, it can only locate things by text or number. It cannot compare a list to another list, which is a little bit you know, tricky. You can ask what is the length of a list, how many items are in the list, okay? which can be helpful. Because if a list is empty, it will return a zero. If a list has one item, it returns one. If a list has 20 items, it returns 20. So it gives you a, the ability to track down, OK, how many things do we have in the list? And I want to go through each and every single item in that list. Um, next one is kind of the same thing. It's really a shorthand. It's list empty. You can probably figure out how to do this given the length of a list. You compare that to zero. If a list has a length of zero, it's empty. Okay, so this one is kind of redundant, but it's nice to have it here because it's more intuitive to say, okay, is it empty or not? Uh, pick a random item from a list. Once again, you can do it with some other means. It's just kind of handy to have it. Uh, index of index in list. Find the position of the thing in the list. Um, once again, we are searching, but instead of telling us whether it is there or not, it will tell you the index. The index of an item is the number, the position of that item. Go ahead. Okay. Now I want to know if it starts at zero or one. It's one. It starts with one. So it's not like array in C or C++ where it's zero oriented. This one is one oriented. The first item has an index of one. All right. Select list item, okay, so given <coughs> index, it will retrieve a particular item. Insert an item into the list. This one allows you to insert an item into any position in the list. So the new item, the other one is appending to the end. In other words, whenever you, uh, you add an item to the list using the previous block, it's always at the end. This one allows you to position the new item any way you want. Can be the first one, can be the second one, and it will adjust all the items accordingly. So it's a very handy way if you really want this item to be the third item of the list, you can just specify that. Okay, I want this new item to be on the in the third position. What what that will do is it will push the original third item to become the fourth item, and so on. Okay, so that's really handy. You cannot do that easily with arrays. Replace item, so you can replace an item in the list. You specify what is the replacement at which position on which list. Okay, that's really handy. You can remove a particular item from a list based on the index. You can put two lists together. Okay, You have one list, list one. You have another list, list two. Now you can make a long list. It's concatenation, basically. You're putting two lists, li two lists together. Uh, you can copy a list. Okay, This one is kind of interesting, because if you don't copy a list and you just, co you just say, this variable is a list. That variable is the same as the first variable. Now you have both variables, quote unquote, pointing to the same list, which is which may or may not be what you want to do. This will clone a list, so the two lists will become independent. 
This one is extremely useful. If you want your program to be robust, this one is extremely useful. Because before you start to do anything that is list specific, you might want to ask, is that really a list? Because if it is not a list and you try to index into that thing, it would just give you a runtime error. The program would just crash. Okay? So instead of having the program crashing and the end user being upset and stuff like that, you can do this first. If the thing that is supposed to be a list is not a list, you can display a kind of more graceful error and just say that, well, we have a problem. You might want to reinitialize the internal database or something along that line instead of having the application just crashing out. Okay. So this one is surprisingly useful. List to CSV row. Okay, this one is kind of useful, but it's not as useful as we think. What is CSV? It stands for comma separated values. Okay, and for those of you who have used spreadsheets or databases, you know what it is. It's basically you know just items separated by commas on a single line. It's useful for simple lists, but if you have a list inside a list. This doesn't work, okay? So it has limited application. It's good for reading like only one line out of a table or something like that. List to CSV table, same thing, okay? It is assuming the list that you provide you know, into the notch is a list of lists. But the second level list only has individual items. So once again, it has limited application because you cannot just say, oh, I have a list of lists of lists of lists. That won't work with this. It does, it's not flexible like that. Uh, these are the opposite. So you can convert a list into a string. You can also convert a string into a list. Okay, So there are ways to reverse it. Do we have any questions about all of these operations? I'm just giving you a really quick re preview of what you can do with lists. Are you guys at least somewhat convinced that a list is kind of special compared to the three <coughs> other types of values? This one gives you a lot of flexibilities, a lot of potentials. You can look up in pairs. Okay, this one, okay, if you just hover, okay, it gives you a very short description, but it is one of the most powerful features of lists as well. We look at these things as key pairs, okay, or key value pairs. So when you have a list of this kind, I'll show you exactly what it looks like. So this is a list, but it is a list of lists, okay, guaranteed. Each item in it has two things. The first one is called a key, which is the name of something. So in this case, I can have name is the key, which is kind of like, this is, this is the tag. The second part is what we call the value, so I can say tag here. And then I, have, I can have a second item, say phone, phone number, and then the value. This is the, the key, this is the value. So if the key is phone, then the value is some actual phone number, right? So we'll say 555555. Third one, maybe address. And then the value of the address is one, two, three, four, forest drive. Okay. So now I have this is what we call a list of key pairs or key value pairs. The thing about this is the ordering is not important. I don't always need to have the address as the last item. It can be the second, it can be the first, doesn't matter at all. Because we have this block here, I can look it up based on the key. So you give me a list of key value pairs, and you tell me what are the valid keys. Then I can use this block here and say, okay, what is the address of this list of key value pairs? The ordering is no longer important because it is locating the value by the tags. Are we kind of getting the idea of this thing here? It's really great not to be position sensitive 
because if you decide that oh I need to add some more you know attributes to whatever I'm saving into TinyDB, this makes it you know independent to the ordering of the items in the list because it is based on the name of the item. Yep. So at that bottom on the key, for your example on the board, like um, the key would be column, and then the pairs would be five 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 five. Okay, so the pairs is the actual list itself. Okay. So in order to oh, use gotcha. a list like this, this list, which is a list of lists, is going to be specified as the pairs. Gotcha. And then the key is going to be name, phone, or address. <coughs> but the block will give me back the actual value corresponding to the key. So it will give me back tag 555, or one, two, three, four, forest drive, depending on what is the key that I specified here. Right. Are there any questions, just concept-wise, okay? Don't worry about the details of what blocks you have to use. Just the concept of a list. Are there any questions about the concept of a list? Can you demonstrate how to initialize a list inside of a list real quick? Absolutely, okay. So let's say that's exactly what I want to do, okay? Let's do that. See, I like questions. Okay, let's do that. So we go to lists here, and then we go all the way back to the beginning because we want to make a list. But this is not just any list. It is a list of three items, right? And you can do this by, you know, by opening, clicking the little blue box and dragging new items. You can make a list of any number of items. This is just for initialization. There are alternative ways to do this, but this is kind of the easiest way. What about each item of that list? I'm trying to create this thing here. The parentheses are only here to indicate what is inside a list, okay? So this is a list of three items. The, o the overall list only has three items. But each item by itself is a list of two items, okay? So now I can use the same block. I go back to lists and I say each item is a list of two items. Okay, let's move this one out of the way. Are we doing okay so far? You can embed, in other words, Make a list is kind of like create a folder. So the result of a folder that you create can be a subfolder of another folder. And that's can what I'm doing. Can you ever add? Can you ever add another list to this first list during the program? Yes. Okay. You can do it. Pro you can do it as a program. You can also do it you know, by by initialization. Okay. okay. So let's say we want to do it the other way. Okay. Let's 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 say we want to do it the other way. Yeah, like if people were signing up for something and you were just adding their information. Yeah, the the yeah, list. absolutely. Okay. So we'll go ahead and do it the other way because the list is empty. So let's let's do it. Let, let's do it this way. I make sure that this list is in fact empty in the big to begin. With, okay. So what I need to do is now I need to append three items to this list individually. I'm going to do the appending, you know, separately. So for each one. I am going to go to list here and say add items to list. Is that okay? Specify my global variable as the list that we are dealing with. Is that okay? But now I have to specify an item to add to the list. But the item that I'm adding to the list is by itself a list of two items because we have the key and then we also have the value. So now we go to list, specify, make a list out of two items. Okay? The first item is the key, the second item is the value. So in this case, I have name as the key, tag as the value. Is that okay? So now I can just replicate this block and deal with uh, phone and 555, 5555, 
and then do one more time for the address. Is that okay? <coughs> so there are ways to do this, and you can also use the other blocks to remove items based on you know uh, certain attributes. Yes. Um, so the okay. Um, so the uh, question is, how would you make it so that how would you make it so that when you actually insert it into a list, you're inserting not just hard numbers, but like what variables that that go in, like. Uh, like, 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 like um, let's say that you have a person who is actually um, trying to actually wear a uh, district. So then, like, you have, yeah, you have to get their username and their password, but that, that's not going to get hard coded unless you do a variable. So, would that be the same concept then? Are you retrieving or are you putting it into it? Are you, are you reading something from the list or are you changing items in the list? I am basically a I'm not a hundred percent sure about what you're what you need to do in your app. Okay. But let let me ask you another question. Let's say you have something like this and I want to change just one item. I want I, I got a new phone number. I need to update this list to a new phone number. Okay, so now the question is, how do we do that? How do you locate that just that item, and then change it to a new value? What if phone is not a key yet, and you have to create that item? So what do we do about those things? Okay, but at this point, there's one more thing I want to point out because you know, this class at this point, I just want you guys to be exposed to the concept of lists. What we can do with lists, we can write you know extra code to do just about anything we want to do. There are two things I want to show you. If I go back to the designer block, I am going to use. Um, I go to connectivity. I drag a web component, which is also a non-visible component. Okay, so you can see that it appears as a, as a non-visible component. But the only reason I do this is because I want to show you one thing that is really handy. There we go. It's this block here. With a web component, it has the, the block called JSON decode. J S O N, you know, decode, text decode. Now let's read the text what it says. Decode the given J S O N JSON a coded value to produce a corresponding app inventor value. A JSON list decodes to a list, a JSON object of name A and name B, blah, 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 and so on. But the thing is, it does work with lists, okay? And you can store a list into one single variable. So this makes it possible for you to communicate with the web type, you know, API application programming interface easily. Because a lot of times, let's say you're trying to interact with uh, Google Apps or some other things, okay? Some of the um, established uh, web interface, they look for JSON type of format. But they are not looking for a single value inside the JSON format. They're looking for a list, you know, a, a clunk of a clunk of values. Now you have the ability to do that. Okay, but this is only for decoding. In other words, this only works well when the web resource is replying to your request with a JSON encoded, you know, value. But what if? you want to use JSON to send some information to somebody else. App Inventor doesn't have the, that ability. But I have written the code to do it. <laughs> it's on the website. It's on the website already. So let me let me locate that just so that you know, some of you, especially those of you who are curious, you can actually read it and figure out, oh, so that's how we can do something like that. 
hope for J S O N. Okay, so I, I wrote two of these. Okay, the first one is non J S O N, which is my old format. Don't read that. The second one is the actual J S O N serializer. Okay, so we'll go ahead and save link as, which is a AIA file. So I'll save it here and go back to App Inventor. So I will abandon this project for now and upload the other one. So import from my computer, list, test list, upload it. Because I just want to show you the code that I wrote here. Let's go back to blocks. And it's a little bit long because I wrote my own subroutine. We'll talk about subroutines also in this class. And this is the code to, to do it. Um, based on how the screen resolution that we have and also the, the complexity of this block, it's a little bit difficult to see the entire code, but that's basically what it is. So now that you have a serializer and then uh, the web object has a decoder, you can, you can now go both ways. Okay? How would you apply this? This is already done. You can, you can, you can copy my code. And by the way, the backpack thing is for this purpose. You can put some code from one project into a backpack, start another project, and then grab it back from the backpack. This is how you do copy and paste across projects. Okay. Last time I taught this class, there was no such feature. If you have a block of code that you want to replicate in another project, guess what? You have to do it manually. <laughs> well, I learned how to hack the actual code in uh, the AIA file to do that. But it's still a hassle. The, the backpack feature is great for doing this. Okay. Okay, but think about this conceptually. Okay, this is all detail. Okay, detailed stuff we can learn later. Conceptually, why do you think this might be helpful? Give you several examples. Okay, so let's say you have one application where you have to send a chunk of information, not just the <coughs> name, just the phone number, but a chunk of information from your phone to somebody else's phone which has the same app installed. Okay? Well, you can do it in several ways. You can do it by email, you can do it by text, and so on and so forth. But the big question is, when the other application receives the message, how does it get all everything back in the order? A list. Okay? You JSON encode it first before you send it, so it becomes you know, encoded. When the other side receives it, they decode it. And this can work with texting. So you won't be sending anything that is really human readable. Well, it's, it's kind of human readable, but it's not intended to be human readable. But the text, um, the other app will receive the text and decode it. So this is how you can, you, know, you can really be flexible about what type of information you can send or receive between you know, two applications or two instances of the same application branding. I think it helps open up a lot of possibilities as far as your apps are concerned because you know you can now you know, send relatively complex information between instances of your application running. Are there any questions about this? Just one more thing. The one more thing is lists also work well with TinyDB. So if you want, if you don't want to be fancy, okay, and transmit anything over the web, over text, and stuff like that, you just want to store it on to TinyDB. This is really great. Let me switch back to my other project. This one here. Okay. So let's say I want to save all my data before I exit. Okay. How do I store this data? What do you think? First of all, we have to use TinyDB, so go to uh, storage, drag and drop a TinyDB into this app, okay? Switch back into the blocks mode, right? So let's just say that I want to store it right away. You go to TinyDB, TinyDB1, and you store that one thing. You store a value. With a store value, you have to give it a tag, which is basically the name. So you can give it any name you want. I'm just going to put in user info here. Okay? What value do you want to store? 
Well, hold on a second here. We got name, we got phone, we got address, and so on. But you know what? They're all inside a list. And TinyDB works well with a list. So now, when you want to save it, you just say, hey, I got everything already in a global variable called items. So next time when you start the app and you want to retrieve everything from TinyDB, you just retrieve based on the tag user info and all items inside the list are retrieved at the same time. So you get the name, you get the address, you also get the phone number. And there's no limitation of how many items you can contain in the list other than the limitation of memory and you know some kind of unlikely limitations that you run into. So are there any questions about the concept of a list? Yep, go ahead. So the, the top half of the code we're creating a list, but we still have to store it somehow, some way, right? Because initially it's going to create an empty list, so that if we don't store it, like with TinyDB, mm -hmm. um, potentially would it wipe it out every time we do the button click? Yep. Okay. Yep. So it should always end with some way of storing whatever that list we're going to create. Yeah, because the global variable item is still a variable. Any variable in, a, in your app is volatile, which means you know, when your app closes, the variable will go away. So before your application closes, closes, you have to store into TinyDB or have some way to store. But this gives you the option of storing like many, many values into one single variable. It will be treated as one single thing. Yep. When I, when I retrieve that list from the TinyDB to, to reload those values into them, it's still a list of all the probably one element essentially? It will be restored into exactly that form. So the save and the restore are reversible because well, they, they, they use exactly the same format. And that's why it is really helpful. And, and if I'm having a, a one of the specific, like I get the, just the phone number, Yeah, you can use the, correct. So if, if to retrieve one of the attributes, you can use the lookup in pairs block. Okay. And that's why it is powerful because you know, this way, you have one single variable, but within that one single variable, you have so many, you can have an infinite number, well, not infinite, but you can have a huge number of attributes that you can store inside one single variable. What do, what are you comparing? Well, I'm just I'm looking up to say phone number. Uh huh. And I don't want to have to write down the phone every time, so if I have a global variable like before, it will always be that same tag thing essentially. Okay, there are several ways to do that. Okay, I'm I'm a little bit out of time today, okay. but you can you can you can write a procedure that only returns the phone attribute of that variable. So you can kind of make a shorthand of it. You know, that's kind of what it is. Yeah, you can use a function, but you can hard <coughs> code a function to only return the phone attribute. So this, if you use it a lot, it can save you a lot of quote unquote space, but that's the idea. Are there any questions about the, uh, why a list can be very, very helpful? Okay. We'll talk about this more on Wednesday, okay? Because I know we didn't really put a whole lot of time into lists today. So on Wednesday, we'll talk about you know how what it looks like, you know what is JSON encoding, because JSON encoding encodes a list into text, so it can be displayed, okay? And so that's what we'll talk about you know, on Wednesday is what does it look like? What is JSON encoding? And then we can look into okay once we know how a list can be displayed. It's Okay, I can already tell you what is JSON encoding. Yes. <laughs> okay, I have been using JSON encoding, but it's it's that's what that's how you can turn a list into serial text, and that's why it's, that's why it's called a serializer. You're turning something that is structured into something that is sequential, and anything that is sequential can be transmitted 
just by text, by email, by file. You can you can share it in many many ways. <coughs> All right. So we are running out of time in the lecture today. So I'm gonna turn off the recorder, and if you have any questions, you know I can answer those questions. Don't forget on Wednesday we have our due date for the project proposal. So you need to work on that and make sure you turn it in on time. Has everybody signed in in the sign-up sheet? Okay, I didn't miss anyone. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna stop the recorder. Let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. I need my coffee. And then when we come back, you know, you guys, if you have questions, we, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer your questions. When you have a list in a list, like you have here.